Birkan Yılmaz and the second part of today's uh, lecture will be uh, by my other postdoc, Şükrü Kur'an. So uh, the ground is yours. Thank you. Okay, we will uh, give a brief uh, summary of the molecular communication part. Before that, I will give you some background information about distributions, binomial distribution, uh, Gaussian distribution, and uh, Channels, channel capacity formulation. Then we will use this uh, background information on the findings of uh, channel capacity in molecular communication. So uh, first, we will focus, uh, we will talk about binomial distribution. It's a discrete probability distribution. You know, I think all you know that it uh, represents uh, something. Uh, for example, you have an experiment uh, and you try. You make the trials uh, n times, and the probability of success in that experiments are, uh, let's say, p. Then it is uh, represented by binomial distribution, and denoted by b m p or binomial m p. And uh, these are the notations for binomial distribution b m p, and parameters. Let's talk about the parameters of binomial distribution, and is a num uh, chosen from uh, natural numbers. Probability can be between 0 and 1. All of them can be. And these are some examples of binomial distributions. Uh, this is the PMF function. It's not PDF because it's uh, not continuous. It is discrete. And uh, you all know, I think, this formulation. The, uh, what is this? How, can you, how do you read this one? having k successes when we have a binomial process np with parameters np. What is the probability of having k successes when you have uh, this binomial process? n chooses k, p to the k times 1 minus p to the n minus k. p of them, uh, k of them are success, n minus k of them are unsuccess. So this is the CDF of binomial distribution. This is regularized incomplete uh, beta function. And this is just the summation of these probabilities up to k. OK? Uh, and this is the tail probability. It uses the uh, property of regularized incomplete beta function. Turns out to be this, the other part of the summation. So. Uh, for example, you have an experiment with, uh, let's say, probability, success probability 0 0, uh, 0.9, and you have hundreds trials. What do you expect? You expect uh, how many of them successful? 90. On the average, 90. It can be 91, 92, 85, maybe 65, but with a very, very, very low probability. OK, this is the distribution of that probabilities for a given parameters. So uh, let's, say, let's talk about some properties of binomial distributions. If you have two binomials, uh, x and y, with b and p and b and p, the success probabilities are same. And the, if they are independent, their sum is also binomial with this parameters. I think it's logical. Yes. You make n more uh, trials with the same conditions. <coughs> and also we use normal approximation of binomials if we want to uh, transfer our problem to continuous case. Uh, we see that it, the binomial PMF is symmetric and uh, looks like a bit Gaussian, yes. So uh, the approximation of uh, binomials can be done if P is not so close to 1 or 0 and MP is large enough. Large enough depends on how much error uh, you can tolerate. Okay, so 
do you remember the approximation, this approximation of binomial to normal distribution? No. Uh, what was the mean of binomial distribution? We talked about it. MP. MP. What was the variance? Variance. NP, 1 minus P, yes? Hence, uh, this is just the normal approximation, the values we used in normal approximation, okay? So, uh, now let's talk about normal distribution. It's a continuous probability distribution. It physically mostly defines the error, error case. Uh, and it is a bell-shaped probability density function. It has bell-shaped probability density function and denoted by normal distribution uh, mu and sigma square. So these are the notations. Parameters mu can be any number in real line. Sigma square must be positive. And this is the PDF of normal distribution. 1 over sigma square root of 2 pi e to the minus x minus mu squared divided by 2 sigma square. So this is the CDF. Uh, it is formulated as a function of phi function, which is the CDF of, do you remember? standard normal distribution. Okay. So for a, if you have normal distribution with 0, 1 and you want to know the probability of x, let's say x is normal distributed and 0, 1, x is less than, let's say, tau. This is phi function. Oops, it's not seen, I think. Okay. So, if we have another distribution, let's say Y, it is normal distributed but not standard one. What we do, remember something from probability lecture, you standardize it. How? You consider this distribution, y minus mu divided by sigma. This is z. This is called z distribution. Okay? So this Z distribution is normal distributed with parameters 0, 1. We will use this trick a lot. Okay, this conversion, not trick, of course. So for our uh, case, X is normal distributed with mu sigma square. So you normalize it. It is phi function of X minus mu divided by sigma, this procedure. Okay. Also, uh, it is 1 minus Q function, which is the tail probability of uh, standard normal distribution. So these formulations can be derived by pen and, uh, pencil and paper. These are the examples of normal distributions with given parameters. And now, what, where we will use these distributions in molecular communication. We will use normal distribution, normal distributed random numbers while simulating Brownian motion. The diffusion process. We will simulate the diffusion process. Uh, we will release some molecules and they will diffuse in the environment. 
according to this distribution with the parameters evaluated to according to the environment. Okay, so uh, we use normal distribution so while simulating Brownian motion for the diffusion process and we will use normal distributions for arrival probabilities for uh, evaluating the probability of hitting to other cell, other nano machine. Okay, and uh, for that part also we will use binomial distributions because think about that I'm releasing a molecule it obeys in the uh, diffusion process it randomly moves at the end uh, it will hit to the cell or not but uh, with what probability if I know the probability hit for one one molecule I can evaluate it for 100 molecules with <coughs> binomial distribution it's a binomial process yes within a certain time amount or okay <laughs> uh, yes because we want to send symbols we want to communicate so we have a time frame and in that time frame we have to evaluate the probability of hit okay so uh, if you have probability of hitting to the destination in the uh, symbol duration let's say 0.9 again uh, what will you expect if I release 100 molecules again we expect 90 molecules will arrive at the destination yeah if I know the dynamics the probability distributions of the arriving molecules I can arrange some threshold to make this process a communication okay of course always there's a probability of error in any communication channel but we will evaluate them okay so uh, this is channel capacity part we will use Shannon's capacity formula from first of all let's see what is the uh, system we have a transmitter it wants to transmit the symbol X to receiver Y but there is a noise channel in between so uh, the received symbol may be different than the sent one okay so uh, we evaluate the probabilities of uh, correct reception false reception and accordingly we evaluate the uh, channel capacity by maximizing the mutual information what is that channel capacity is denoted by C it is the supremum or we may say maximum in discrete cases supremum of mutual information what is the mutual information this is the formulation for mutual information uh, use some the information when you get correct reception and you decrease the uh, information when you get false reception how do you do that you sum the p log p values of the cases okay this is an example I think it will be more clear here uh, Alice wants to send to uh, 0 or 1 as the symbol to the Bob uh, and these are the probabilities of correctly receiving the send symbol and these are the crossover probabilities this is binary symmetric channel so uh, making error uh, probability is same for both cases and uh, you see that the uh, you know this sign given that okay given the condition that 
given the condition that you sent zero, x is zero, send symbol is zero, what is the probability of receiving y equals zero? One minus p. Others are similar. And uh, so we put them on this equation, uh, pro probability of seeing x and y equal to one or zero or one zero zero one, all cases, we sum over them. And uh, okay, here in this communication channel, what is uh, the free variable? What can I adjust? What can I change? Uh, I can change the number of zeros or ones sent. Yeah. There is no thresholding mechanism. I don't know what the, what is the encoding decoding part. But what can I do? I can send more zeros than more ones. Yeah, more zeros than ones. If I arrange my code book accordingly, I can send more zeros. Okay. So, uh, for example, zero zero means zero. Zero one means one. So mostly you send zero. Okay, I can arrange this one. The only free variable here, I can change the probabilities of sending zero or one, which is px. Probability of sending zero means px equals zero, or px equals one. If I sum over these probabilities, the channel capacity, I evaluated it on MATLAB and plot them, the mutual information, we see that uh, for probability of error case, crossover probabilities, uh, these are the, if you have crossover probability 0.1, the maximum capacity you achieve on 0.5 probability of sending 0 and 1 equals. And for the other cases also, maximum is achieved in 0.5. And these are the maximum channel capacities that can be achieved. While you are sending two bits, for example, let's talk about this one, two bits, you are actually sending one bit information. Okay? So, Let's evaluate the mutual information for BSC with these parameters. This point. What is this? So, something like that, I think you will have. Point 53. And these logarithms are base 2. Of course, I forget it. If you want to measure the bit information, okay? So, in our case, in molecular communication, uh, we, if we set the probability of sending one and zero equal, then we can arrange the, we can change the threshold value. Also, we have another uh, value to play with. Uh, if we change the threshold value, then the probability of correct reception and wrong reception changes. So the channel capacity changes. We follow this approach. We set the probability of sending one and zero equal and uh, we want to find optimal threshold, okay? Also, you can use this approach. You set the thresholds, fix them. Then you uh, want to find the optimal value for probability of sending one and zero. This is much more EE style, electrical engineering style. But here we are in a molecular communication and 
uh, nano machines, let's say, or cells are more adaptive or more, uh, in this case, it is more feasible to adapt the situation, arrange the thresholds, okay? These are the background informations. Now we can start with part one. Okay, I will uh, start from the beginning and come to the point where we focus while we are doing research here in uh, Boaz University. And uh, focus on mostly molecular communication, then Shikru will come and uh, he will focus on ion signaling, calcium signaling. So, first of all, uh, there is a very huge difference between EM case and molecular communication, nano networks or nano networks, because of, uh, in EM case, we all know the antenna behavior, pet loss model, how uh, electromagnetic wave uh, tra propagates, travels, and uh, what, however, in our case, in molecular communication or another nano networking issue, the dynamics are very different. So uh, complexity is different. They are more simple objects, let's say, uh, however, when they cooperate, very complex behaviors are observed. And uh, I think in this room, the most complex uh, objects are not uh, the computers or uh, projectors or the camera you are <laughs> using. I think uh, they are us. The, when you look for one cell, it is not that complex maybe, but in, when, uh, when they cooperate, it is the most complex uh, machine in the world, I think. And they will have cells assembly, maybe time synchronization, but here time synchronization is hard. So when scaling down, we have some problems. Uh, first of all, the most important reason for these differences is surface to volume ratio. Because, uh, think about this, uh, you are, uh, you have a, a rope tied to your belt and uh, at the end of the rope you have a huge kite. Okay, so when it is flying on the air, uh, the forces are transferred to your body. Okay, so the surface to volume ratio uh, says that in the very small scale, you are uh, affected by the flows around. Okay, so uh, you are much more surfing in the environment. So you are not, uh, you cannot have aim to reach somewhere. You cannot walk, okay? So uh, also interatomic forces play a significant role. Uh, you mainly affected by the thermal energy. Thermal energy, what thermal energy says to you, you do that, okay? So, but uh, inertial forces and weights are negligible. So this is the basic definition, first of all, of uh, nano-networking, nano-networks. First of all, uh, the communication network must be engineered by human, humans for achieving a communication between two parties. Communication between two parties at a nanometer scale, it says, but not the all components in nanometer scale. At least one component or uh, part must be in nanometer scale. For example, in molecular communication, the, you can be 
in a micrometer scale as a nano machine. However, the particles you release to make communication must be in uh, maybe in a nanometer scale. Then it's a nano networking issue. There are approaches, bottom-up approach, top-down approach, and biohybrid approach. We follow biohybrid approach mostly. And bottom-up approach, you construct very simple nanomachines out of uh, small particles and you build up. And for the top-down approach, you scale down the machines to smaller ones, uh, MEMS or NEMS, nano uh, electromechanical systems. And for the biohybrid approach, we observe the uh, nature and cells, then we mimic their actions. We inspire from the cell biology. And these are the expected features of nanomachines. They will be self-contained, self-assembly, self-replication, moving capability, energy production capability, and communication capability. If self-contained, what do I mean? They will all have uh, instructions embedded, okay? They will be autonomous in some sense. And these are the applications on nano networking, networks on chip, system on chip, nano robotics, immune monitoring. These are the pills you have mentioned, I think. And uh, biohybrid implants and augmentation. I can't imagine the interface between the mechanical arm, the artificial arm, and the main body. They are very incredible and realized uh, issues. And uh, food and water quality control, MBC defense, and it has many, many, many applications. So let's focus what we are doing. Focus on what we are doing. I, will talk, I said I will talk about molecular communication mostly. What is molecular communication? There is a communication between two parties, and if the information carrier is a molecule, then it's a molecular communication. And uh, these are the types of molecular communications, and there are also much more. Communication via diffusion, CVD system, calcium signaling, microtubules, bacteria-based communication, pheromone signaling, and we mostly focus on these three in our lab, in our projects, let's say. And uh, warning, there are challenges ahead. And uh, you, the medium properties are very exciting. And diffusion dynamics, you have to understand them very well. You have to do lead survey very carefully. Uh, for young researchers, uh, I have to say that lead survey is the most important part of your research. You have to do lead survey very, very carefully. And uh, there are high propagation delays, as in the case of satellite networks, something like that, and more than that, of course. And biocompatibility issues for in vivo applications. So, uh, what do I mean by nano machine? It's a human engineered machine. It may be living or not living thing, but it will mostly have uh, these parts. Power plant, what do I mean by power plant? It, it will convert raw materials into energy, like mitochondria. It will have a factory for synthesizing proteins or molecules, other molecules, from raw materials, like endoplasmic reticulum. And packager, let's say, uh, it will package, wrap the several molecules into one uh, in a protective shield, like Golgi apparatus. And protective shielding for itself, not to dissolve in the environment. So, Cells do communicate. This is the representing figure. Uh, first, the molecules are synthesized. Then they're wrapped in a protective shield. And they go to, uh, to the edge, uh, the membrane, and they make 
uh, membrane fusion and release the molecules and they communicate. Okay, so this is our system. We are mimicking this behavior and uh, this is just the sending part. We, this is the whole system model and uh, when will we have a break? Minutes recording we have done. Okay. <coughs> Let's continue then. Okay, this is the whole system model. And uh, there's a transmitter node, receiver node, and uh, transmitter node encodes the inf information on molecules and release them. And they propagate according to diffusion dynamics. And some of them goes the other way, some of them reaches the receiver and they are received by the receiver and the signal detection is achieved here and decoded the information. So we have three main, three main parts. Encoding information, propagation and decoding information. For encoding information, what can I do? I can encode the information on the type of the molecule. If I want to say one, I send type one type of molecule. If I want to say zero, I uh, send another type of molecule. For example, this is sending the information. Okay? I can uh, encode the information on the number of molecules. For example, if I want to send zero, as an information, I send no molecule. If I want to send one, I send thousand molecules, for example. And we know the, we will see the diffusion dynamics and we will uh, have the PDF of arriving number of uh, arriving uh, properties. Then we will make it uh, for this kind of uh, information encoding, the decoding part must be a thresholding mechanism. If it is above a threshold, it will understand that the uh, other nano machine is saying one to me. If it is below the threshold, I will understand that other nano machine is sending zero to me. Okay. Also, frequency of arrivals may be the information encoding option. And. Now we encode the information, now the diffusion part, the propagation part. Uh, when I release a molecule into the environment, since it's the uh, it's ratio of surface uh, area to the volume is high, uh, it will obey the um, environmental forces, let's say, uh, thermal energy. And it will do Brownian motion. No energy is used for this particle to move around because it has no idea where he will end. Okay. Uh, it will obey Brownian motion. And for example, in a 1D example, uh, the messenger molecule, let's say, uh, propagates in x direction only and uh, at each time step it will step to the right or left with this amount it obeys the normal distribution with mean zero and sigma square is sigma is this you will have a project about this you will simulate some uh, something like this and uh, according to this, to normal, this distribution, normal distribution, I get a random number and add it to its current position. Plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus. At the end, maybe it will reach to the destination. Okay? By the way, this is glycerol, <laughs> the model of glycerol. Uh, in this formula, the 
sigma, uh, the D is, D is the diffusion coefficient. For 3D environment, you will uh, have three display, displacements according to normal distribution independently. For the 4D environment, which is uh, fictitious, for it is not real uh, case, uh, it may have more than three, x, y, z, and u direction. In any case, you can simulate by this formula, normal distribution, uh, the Brownian motion. So, if we don't know the diffusion coefficient, we can evaluate the sigma by these formulations if messenger molecule uh, size is similar to the uh, molecules in the fluid. We take this formula. This is Boltzmann constant. This is temperature. Uh, eta is viscosity. Rs is the Stokes radius of the molecule. If the me messenger molecule size is much, much more than uh, fluid molecules, then it obeys this formulation. So, okay, I released hundred or thousand molecules and I record the arrival times. If I uh, have this histogram, I, uh, if I have this information, I can plot the histogram of heating molecules. So in this figure, this is the histogram of heating molecules for distance 16 micrometers. Uh, some of them are hitting to the destination at a very early phase. Most of them nearly here at four seconds. Of, uh, I think this is, let's say this is four. Uh, this is the 50% cutoff time. What do I mean by 50% cutoff time? Up to four seconds, 50% of the heating molecules are arriving, not all the molecules. This is the 60% cutoff, and we see that 80% uh, cutoff time is so high. It is something like 24 seconds which is not feasible for a communication. For sending one symbol, you wait for 24 seconds. Not feasible. Okay, so... Maybe at this point, uh, we might want to explain one thing. Uh, okay, if I wait for something like 25 seconds, almost 80% of the molecules that uh, arrive will have hit the uh, destination uh, non emission what if I wait indefinitely? Will I receive 100% of the transmitted molecules? Hmm. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. We talked about it. <laughs> Remember? It depends. It depends. Something to say. I don't remember the exact name of that, but maybe we can receive the molecules of. Uh, one before the communication. Okay. okay. Consider That's another is, issue. Consider a single symbol transmitted. There was nothing in the channel before. I sent a single symbol, which means, for example, I'm, let's say, releasing thousand molecules to the environment as a transmitter cell. Let's say one molecule. Okay. Or let's say one molecule. I release it. Some other cell might get it. No, the environment is artificial. The environment is artificial. Mathematically, there is one. Yes, yes. What do you think? For a dimensional space. What do you think if you have infinite time? Space is bounded. No, unbounded. It is artificial. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> the answer is no. In 
two dimension, the answer is yes. When you have two or one dimension, heating probability is one for infinite amount of time. But when we are jumping to 3D, the dynamics are changing. Uh, the differential equations, let's say, the solutions of differential equations results in uh, non-zero survival probability. Correct? Okay, but you have to say the uh, definition of the survival probability. Survival probability is not hitting. The hitting probability is not one. Yes. It's less than one. Becomes it may be less than one, yes. But this is for the case that we're talking about a three-dimensional unbounded space. There are only a transmitter cell and a receiver cell <coughs> in the environment. But it is unbounded region. You wait indefinitely. Still, the molecule may not have arrived. If you're talking about 2D. If you're, talk if you're talking about 2D, then if you wait indefinitely, if that molecule will arrive. Yes. So there's a change, uh, there's a difference between 2D and 3D. And 4D, 5D. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> up to 2D, <laughs> up to 2D, including 2D, it is guaranteed that in, in different times it will arrive. Beyond the, the, 2D, it's not guaranteed. They are thinking I am joking. <laughs> okay, so uh, what is the optimal TS value? It must be considered. And uh, when I cut from, let's say, 60%, let's say that is the uh, symbol duration, then uh, some of the molecules will hit the receiver at the next symbol duration. Yeah? They will accumulate. Okay, now we can stop here I think yes uh, so from the histogram which is a symbol duration and we assume that the remaining parts the remaining molecules will come at the second uh, symbol duration maybe of course it's probabilistic and uh, not uh, f f uh, far away from that duration, the second symbol duration, they will not arrive. Okay, only two symbol durations they are active. We assume that. This is the assumption. There are no remaining molecules from symbol frame that is two before the current symbol frame, and much more. Of course, three frame, two, four frames, or more frames before the current symbol frame. Okay. So. Uh, how many of the molecules from current and previous symbol arrive at the receiver? Uh, if this is the, let's look uh, first, uh, first of all, let's look uh, to the current frame. You release some molecules and uh, some of them arrive at the destination. How many of them? It obeys the binomial distribution with parameters, number of molecules and probability of heat values for a given symbol duration period. And uh, how many of the molecules from the previous symbol? With the, we denote it by MP. And it's, uh, again, uh, if you consider one symbol duration, binomial, but in two symbol durations, uh, let's draw it. This is the current symbol, symbol uh, the beginning of the current symbol duration. And you release and see molecules. However, uh, this is the previous symbol. In that case, maybe some molecules and P molecules are released at this point. How many of them arrive at this duration? Not this duration, but, okay? You will 
subtract this part from the this part. Okay? You have two TS for arriving molecules, but you remove one TS part. So it obeys uh, individual, they obey binomial distributions for two TS part minus one TS part. Uh, what do we do? We have the Gaussian approximations of both. Uh, summation of binomials are, again, binomial, but the uh, subtracting two binomials is not resulting in a binomial. Okay? So we make the Gaussian approximations for both, and that, uh, this is the easier part. We make them Gaussian then uh, we subtract them. How do you subtract two Gaussian random variables? For example, or add. You have two normal distributions with mu1, sigma square 1. What is the summation of both distributions? Two distributions. Hmm? x1, x2, what is x1 plus x2? It is normal distributed. Wait. Mu1 plus mu2. Variance. Remember. Sigma 1 square plus sigma 2 square. Okay. What about when I subtract? Me 1 minus me 2. What about the variance? No. It is summation. Variance, variance always adds up when you add two distributions. Okay? So, we make these approximations so we can have a normal distribution for this random variable. So, let's think about this case. When previous symbol is zero, what do I release? How many molecules are released? Zero molecules for symbol zero. And molecules for sending one. So what will I do for this case? If SP is zero, S current symbol is one. Maybe using another pen. Okay. Then what will be the total number of molecules and hit? Will obey. Since the previous symbol is zero, I release no molecules. So they will not remain to the next uh, symbol duration. Zero plus. I release for the current symbol one and molecules, which is binomial and P, P1, let's say. What is P1? P hit in one symbol duration. P hit one TS. Okay. So what about the next one? If previous symbol is one. So this is binomial, of course. This is deterministic. What about the next one? Previous symbol is one. Current symbol is one. What will be the distribution of n hit? First of all, molecules from the previous one. 
What is what was that? Remember? Subtracting two binomials. Binomial and P. Let's say P two minus binomial and P P one plus from the current one binomial and C P one. So if we use Gaussian approximations, we end with this case. What is the mean? Let's evaluate this one. If they are all n, if I release n molecules for sending one, let's say they are all n, the mean will be n minus n plus n n times oops sorry n p2 minus n p1 plus n p1 this is the mean which is n p2 if you make Gaussian approximations you will see this is the result okay So, what are the tail probabilities? Let, let, let's recall that. We have, if we have normal distribution with mu and sigma square, the probability of having, uh, for our case, number of hitting molecules greater than a threshold can be evaluated by Q function. So, we will make a thresholding, we said, at the decoding part. If the number of hitting molecules is above the threshold, I will say one. If below the threshold, I will say zero for a simple communication model. So uh, we evaluate that, evaluate the cases of correct reception and false reception by these tail probabilities. For the binomial, again, we have tail probabilities, which is a function of regularized incomplete beta function which gives the summation of probabilities of binomial. So, at the end, we will do, we said that we will do thresholding. Okay, so thresholds may be fixed or may depend on the previous symbol. If we assume that our model is uh, considering the molecules from the previous symbol, thresholds, may, uh, changing the thresholds according to previous symbols, uh, gives better results. So we name it concentration shift keying. And uh, this is the BCSK, this is the QCSK case. We have three thresholds, one threshold here. You can send two bits if you want, then which is QCSK. So uh, I said that we can evaluate the correct reception and erroneous cases, the probability of receiving, for example, for this case, you have previous symbol is one, current symbol is one. We did this binomial and normal distribution. We got it, the distribution of the hitting molecules. Then we will evaluate what? Receiving one correctly, when the previous symbol is one. I said one, what's the probability of receiving it correctly. Probability of n hit greater than tau gives me the correct reception probability for this case, which is Q function for that given distribution. For the erroneous reception, false reception, we have one minus correct reception, of course. For this case, if the previous symbol is one, current symbol is zero, you have, again, uh, since you sent zero, no molecules, what is the false, uh, correct reception case? Number of hit molecules must be below the threshold. That is the correct reception case. 
So we search for the uh, probability of having an P Y M P less than threshold. Why? Because we send it zero and we want to... We send for the current symbol zero. Just the uh, remaining molecules from the previous symbols are remaining, okay? So it must be, and P must be less than threshold. This is the correct reception probability for this case. For this case, uh, we have NC greater than threshold. Why? Again. No, it's will be from previous. Okay. And only there is current symbol. I released, uh, for one, I released N molecules, which obeys in binomial distribution. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So this is the tail probability of binomial distribution. So we evaluate like this. For this case, you cannot make mistake. <laughs> Correct reception. You always correctly receive it. If the previous symbol is zero, current symbol is zero, you do not uh, send molecules in previous and current symbols, so received molecules are zero. Always. What we assumed, I erased that part, there is no molecules remaining from the previous previous symbol. Okay? That is an assumption. So always you correctly decode it. So this is the channel capacity evaluation part. We uh, we have two cases when previous symbol is one, when previous symbol is zero. Correct reception probabilities, false reception probabilities. We all evaluate these cases, and uh, so we can plug these results into. Shannon's formula. What can I change? What is the optimization parameter? Thresholds. Thresholds. I change the thresholds, so these probabilities change. Correct reception and false reception probabilities. So the channel capacity changes. Okay? So we maximize mutual information over tau. So here we have Project NAND at Boas University, NAND networking via diffusion. These are the issues we are focusing on. Modeling, RX design, TX design, channel related issues. And uh, what we do in our research, this was the first, uh, the paper, uh, energy model for communication via diffusion in nano networks. And uh, we developed the energy model for CVD. And channel capacity, we evaluate the performance of BCSK, binary concentration shift king, in terms of channel capacity per energy. And uh, we used eukaryotic cells, in particular pancreatic beta cell. These are the results for different distances and different threshold values. And these are the BPS values, bits per second values for different energy levels you have for communication. This is picowatt, I think. 3 picowatt, 4.5 picowatt, and 9 picowatts. Then uh, this is the paper in Monacom, I think. Yes, uh, Infocom workshop. Uh, we analyze the release point effect. What is release point effect? Uh, you have two cells, and when you release the molecules uh, from the closest point, it is most effective one. But what if you release it erroneously a bit higher uh, location, let's say alpha, according to alpha parameter, you can change the release point. And uh, the release point affects the probability of heat. Also, we analyze the average propagation delay. And this is the 
cross-channel interference for communication via diffusion molecular communication paper in Bionetics in the United Kingdom. Uh, here we have two communicating parties and they are separated by H value. Uh, why we do this? Uh, because when you release some molecules from uh, sender A, also it may be the case that receiver B may collect them. It may hit to the receiver B. So they, they are affecting their communication. We call it co-channel interference. It is, uh, it's an interference for the other party. So co-channel interference effect is analyzed and up to our knowledge, this is the first work in the literature uh, for co-channel interference. Also the energy model is first work in the literature uh, in this domain. So these are the results. When you increase the separation value, the channel capacity increases for each distance. So uh, this is the modulation, modulation paper. This is the uh, modulation techniques for communication via diffusion in nano networks. It is published in the conference ICC, Toyota. And uh, the modula modulation techniques, CSK and MOS MOSK are analyzed. Uh, CSK is concentration shift king. MOSK is the Molecular <laughs> shift keying. We change the type of molecule. We uh, encode the information on the molecule type. So effect of noise is also analyzed in this work. Uh, we see the, some performance figures, channel capacity versus SNR. In this work, we again analyze the uh, co-channel interference and also intersymbol interference. What is intersymbol interference? In our case, inter-symbol interference is considering the previous symbol. The previous symbol affects the current symbol. Okay? So we analyze both all modulation techniques with different modulation techniques. Okay? So we again see that the uh, H separation when a uh, separation increases, channel capacity increases. This is for BCSK. And this is for BMOSK. MOSK. So we achieved these parts and we haven't touched the RX part yet. Maybe you may be the one touching that part. Um. Okay, so um, after Bikan's talk, um, I'm going to explain, talk about some other uh, communication technique we are focusing on in uh, our lab in here. Uh, again, in the context of the nano networking and the molecular communication, which is called by another group, in, in a Japanese group, calcium signaling. So, uh, okay, I think, uh, I think I'm skipping this part. All right. So uh, usually uh, there are different types of molecular communication techniques uh, currently. Uh, one of them is the diffusion-based communication, uh, the one we can talk about in the last few hours, I think. There are different things like the molecular motors, pheromone signaling. Some people uh, say that let us load the information into a bacteria, uh, the DNA of a bacteria, and let them move in the environment and uh, relay that information to the receiver, uh, which is kind of a slow, but uh, how do you say, tons of information are being uh, sent in one communication. Uh, another thing that we're focusing on is like, the, uh, as I said, calcium signaling. I mean, they have, all of them have biological backgrounds, all of them are different pro problems, different issues to be resolved, and most of them are uh, promising actually. And we here focus on the first and the last one. Oops. Okay, so calcium signaling is um, basically uh, you use the uh, um, ions 
as the name suggests, calcium ions, you can use other ions and uh, encode information on top of the, those ions. So, there is some other chemical, uh, this is actually something called um, intercellular calcium waves in the biological literature. I mean, most of our cells, regardless of the tissue, use this kind of mechanics, okay? Uh, as a, how do you say? When one uh, cell in a tissue is being triggered, it relays the, that information to the other cells in the same tissue. So the, the, the whole tissue behave as a one group, as a one entity, okay? It's like uh, coordination, it's like saying group behavior, whatever you can call it. Uh, so say in a very simple example, there are two cells, okay? And one is somehow triggered by a chemical signal, the pH value, the temperature is increased, you name it, I mean, it doesn't matter in our uh, case. So uh, when the cell is triggered by the stimulus, a chemical called IP3 is uh, released inside the cell. These IP3 chemicals enables the cell to release uh, some calcium ions stored in an organelle, which is like a storage, like a, a depot of the calcium signals, okay, uh, sorry, the calcium ions. So the cytoplasmic uh, calcium um, concentration increases due to the increase of the IP3 molecules. Then the IP3 moves through some gates called gap junctions between the cells, which are actually literally gaps. I mean, there's a gap there, okay? Uh, and again, triggers the same reaction on the next cell. So consider this the thing uh, is going on on the third cell, the fourth cell, and the fifth cell. So it always triggers the um, increased uh, calcium concentration inside cells as the IP3 moves along the cells. So we can say there's a communication, there's a relaying uh, dynamic behavior in here. Okay. So we say the information can be encoded in this time varying ion concentration. You see, because there was, before the stimulus come, uh, the calcium concentration is low, say, then it was increased. Uh, after a while, the calcium ions will be taken back inside this organelle. So the calcium ion uh, concentration is a time varying parameter. So based on this time varying uh, signal, let's say, and based on some parameter of the signal, say the, uh, and, um, some, you can sample them, you can use the exact value, you can use the frequency of the signal, the phase, whatever property you want to use, you can encode your information. You can encode any information on top of these signals, which we call the calcium signaling. Okay, uh, this is a chemical, um, sorry, biological phenomenon. As far as I remember, it's, uh, it's observed like 10 or 15 years ago, it's a new thing in, also in biology. Uh, I mean, hopefully for us too, because it's not all the topics hasn't been resolved yet. Uh, biology people are still trying to model, uh, build some mathematical models for the uh, uh, calcium waves. And different tissues have different properties for the calcium waves, as far as we understand, by the way. Uh, the good part is, compared to the regular diffusion, it has a longer range. Because diffusion, as far as we can see from our simulations and analytical results, uh, the, the diffusion in a normal environment can, I don't know, can go like 15, 20 micrometers for a reasonable communication. Beyond that, the symbol duration is uh, too much for a uh, serious communication. But here, in the ICW cases, you can reach to that ranges. And it is kind of faster than the uh, basic diffusion. There are two pathways that can be used, uh, that is used in the biology. Uh, one is one I, uh, the one I talked about. This is called the internal pathway, which is triggered via the IP3 molecules and uses those gap junctions. 
Oops, you deleted that? No, okay. So there is a second one called external uh, pathway, which is, again, the IP tree is used, but also the ATP, you know, the energy, the adenosine three phosphate, I think most of you remember it from the biologies. No? Okay. So the, eight, uh, the, the cell also releases ATP to the extracellular environment. And those ATP trees um, moves along the uh, extracellular environment and triggers the other cells so that they can, um, the signal is relayed. In this uh, pathway, the gap junctions are not used. So the, uh, according to which model you're trying to uh, understand, uh, these, both, both of these pathways are used in conjunction with another, or one is like the more important, the second one is like the less important one. It depends on which biological model you can uh, you use. In our case, we mostly use this one because you know this is more like the diffusion, right? Because uh, the mo the, there are some molecules moving along the environment, triggering each other, which is very similar to diffusion. But in here, there is a confined environment. There are limits. The IP tree cannot go outside. Okay. It can only move cell to cell. Since the environment is more confined, uh, it is more easier to IP3 to move to the next cell. It is faster. Considered like a more controlled environment uh, compared to this one. Okay. So this is the gap junctions. I'm skipping this. This is a bit more uh, biological thing. But the good, the, the important thing for us is. The gap junctions has an open closed state. That is important. It's like a door, okay? I mean, the cell can decide, okay, let me close the door for some time. Let me reopen the door again after some time passes. So we're talking about, I mean, we haven't done anything yet, but it's like, you know, uh, we can build some routing algorithm based on this thing. Okay, open it now based on the, uh, your routing table. Open this door, close this door. If the load of this uh, path seems like a uh, very loaded one, okay, close this one and then open the other one. Something like that. Do we know exactly what causes the gap junctions to open and close? Usually some ionic concentration changes as far as I remember. Like, um, okay, yeah. I mean, the, uh, the, what was the name of this? Cell membrane? Okay, there's some, uh, Ionization on cell membrane, but some part of the cell membrane, sorry, not the whole of the cell, cell membrane. Say this part is uh, ionized, so the gap junctions in that part opens. Mm -hmm. Say that it, it loses ionization, it reverses its original state, it cl uh, closes again. Something like that, but it's one of many uh, methods that it can be opened or closed, as far as I remember. Or you want to have a term project about that? No? <laughs> you can, you can. Maybe. It seems good. It seems good, but uh, I should be able to know how to control, I don't know. The cell knows which one needs okay. to be opened. Okay. And it opens the one which needs, right? Yes. But we don't know how to. Yes, but we, first we, we learn from which dynamics, which uh, chemical reactions that it can direct which part to open, which part to close. So then we can build our mechanism on top of that using, I don't know, something. It's not our domain, you know. Could be interesting. Yeah, I mean, you're not computer architecture class, right? I mean, we're not designing chips, whatever. So we're always uh, I mean, uh, thinking about the, the communication networking aspects of these issues. This could be a more routing issue. That's true. I mean, maybe some link layer, I don't know. More about networking layer, as far as I see, but okay, this can lead to many different things. I don't know. As far as I say, um, I mean, um, this is the basic, uh, or not, ba not, not the basic one, the, the most cited, the most uh, known to us at least in the biology literature, I mean, there are tons of different models which say, okay, this part is uh, included in the model, this part shouldn't be included in the model, and uh, they say, 
okay, say this sixth one is included for astrocytes, but then not for pancreatic cells. I mean, uh, uh, this is too much biology. So we just say that, okay, this seems like a reasonable model, including different dynamics. And we want to uh, move on uh, using this model. So this is like, as I said earlier, there's external stimulus comes, it triggers something called the G, G, G proteins. It then against the trigger of the PLC, some chemical, we don't know, we don't, uh, I mean, it's not important for us. But uh, the important part is it triggers the release of IP3, which is crucial for our uh, communication, right? The other ones are the intermediary things. The IP3 goes to these organelles, the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum. There are some IP3R uh, proteins, it's like, again, some gates. When the IP3 and IP3R meet, uh, they form a chemical bond and the doors of these organelles open. These organelles have different uh, importance or jobs, but for our point of view, they're just calcium storage, uh, storage okay? And we don't care about their other uses. So, when the IP3 and IP3 re receive, uh, receptors are forming bonds, the calcium ions are released into the cyto uh, cytoplasm. Uh, the funny thing is, the calcium ions, also the increased calcium ions, trigger the uh, release of another PLC type, which in turn triggers the release of IP3 more. So there's kind of a positive feedback loop here. The more IP3 you have, the more calcium you have in the, cyt in the cyt cytoplasm. The more uh, calcium in the cytoplasm you have, the more IP3 you have. It seems like it goes uh, to infinity until all of these uh, stores are empty. But hopefully there is something called, uh, uh, there is a negative feedback loop there. If the cytoplasmic calcium amount exceeds the threshold. These doors are closed. Okay? So they are both, uh, I'll say, uh, affected by the IP trees and the calcium concentration amount. So there's a one positive feedback loop, there's a one negative feedback loop, which I think can control uh, the amount of calcium, I mean, which saves the cell to uh, put uh, all the calciums in the uh, organelles in the cytoplasm uh, because this is a very terrible case for the cell. If the si calcium is too much in the cell for too long, the cell dies. It's, not, uh, it's very uh, highly ionized and cannot survive. I don't know the reason, but it dies. So, this is not straightforward. Like. Uh, I'm pushing this guy, he's pushing that guy, he's pushing that guy, and there's a linear relationship. No, it's not that simple. There are feedback loops. Uh, okay, on top of these biological concepts, uh, Nakano et al. proposed this communication, uh, sorry, calcium signaling uh, thing, which is composed of actually two parts. The transmitter, sorry, three parts a transmitter, the calcium channel, and the receiver. So there's a transmitter, which, one, which have a message to send to the uh, receiver. He somehow released a chemical, some temperature, whatever uh, you call that. But that thing uh, can call, uh, triggers the calcium channel, okay? It's like the stimulus here. It's like the external stimulus here. So since the, when the first uh, chan, uh, cell is triggered with the external stimulus, it creates a calcium uh, wave which goes on through the channel. And when it reaches the, uh, the last cell on the uh, channel, the receiver senses it, again, from some mechanism. It is the, uh, the third part, the decoding part. So the messages received at the receiver end. So we have the uh, usual encoding, propagation, decoding part of a communication system. Okay. 
So the good part is so far, we, uh, as far as we can see from the models and the biology, it has higher range, it has higher speed than the uh, basic diffusion. Uh, it is like 20 times faster than the diffusion or microtubule networks. We haven't talked about microtubule, but okay, don't matter. Uh, it is shielded from the outside environment. So you can put different channels, you see, another channel can move here, which cannot cause interference to each other because they're shielded. They're like the, uh, what was the name, STP cables, shielded twisted pair. I think nobody has, am I seeing STPs now? No. Okay, I think the antenna cable from the TVs was supposed to be STP, but. Coaxial cable. Coaxial cable? Where do you use coaxial cable now? No. Antenna. Antenna, okay. Whatever, so the, the, the important thing is like a shielded medium. The, the downside of this system is there's, I think there should be a pre-deployment uh, property. You have to put the channel before you, want, you start the communication. Because you know, in diffusion, you are free. You have the transmitter, you have the receiver. You don't care about the environment that much. You release the molecules, the molecules do the Brownian motion. But here, before you start the communication, you have to somehow build this channel. You're using the channel. Like you, you have to put the cables. So it might be like, this um, might seem like a, a little bit wired communication, you know? It resembles that, I mean, I think. The diffusion is more like a wireless, this is more like a wired communication. Uh, there's some uh, numbers about, we, we, we try to do some energy uh, model of this thing, but so far we haven't uh, finished the whole, I would say, uh, close formulation thing about energy model. These are some numbers, uh, oh, energy consumption. Finally, um, we say, okay, using this one-to-one -one communication, how can we use uh, uh, build an, a, a network. Say there are some devices here. This is purely conceptual, purely theoretical. Some nano machines here. There's a hub there. So uh, similar to the star topology we use, you can build some different uh, calcium channels, which work independent to each other, which is like a. a um, what was it? Unicast? No. What cast? No, it is unicast. Full duplex, sorry. I'm trying to remember. Okay. This can be like a full duplex channel, uh, but how can you decide on uh, which one? I mean, uh, when the nano machine is trying to send something to the hub, or this hub is trying to say something to the nano machine. So we can, for example, say that you can use different ions. Calcium for upstream, say potassium for downstream, if it is possible biologically. I'm just uh, speaking for out loud. Similarly, remember the uh, bus topology from the old times? I don't know, from the third grades, there's this uh, old topology nobody uses now, I think. It's all replaced by the star topologies. But if you remember from the old um, switches, the repeaters, there was something like that, that there's a single channel which all devices are connected to, uh, but only uh, one communication pair can tra uh, transmit information at a given time. So something like that can be built using a single channel, which uh, requires less, uh, say, I would say, wiring or calcium channeling, I don't know less number of cells, uh, what is kind of slower or no. Or in, on a, another, uh, from another perspective, uh, anybody knows the sensor networks? Uh, okay, so we can say that, uh, okay, let's consider that the guys, the, the cells inside the calcium channel are actually the transmitters too. So there's a sync node in the between, and there are tons of uh, cells around. Some of them are connected to others, but there is a path from every cell to the sync node. 
with the gap junctions. So if one of them is triggered, it senses something, fire, temperature, pH, I don't know. It uh, triggers the calcium signal link and it reaches the sync node and say that, okay, in this part of the graph, something has occurred, some event has occurred. So that you have to uh, do something about it. I don't know, release a chemical, uh, I mean, war some, uh, somebody, some I don't know, fireman, policeman, whatever. Or this is a group of devices who wants to act uh, as one. So the sync node can use the calcium signaling as a synchronization tool. Okay, saying that, okay, get ready to, I don't know, do that thing, release the chemical, say. It says this release the chemical signal, it propagates through the whole cell, like flooding, the flooding uh, routing method. So when each cell releases that signal, it uh, executes the job, what it's supposed to do. So as far as I said, this is a very, very new uh, communication paradigm. I mean, I remember like three or four papers so far who have been published on this thing. Uh, I mean, um, but this is, as far as I think or I believe, this is more uh, promising than the diffusion, kind of. Because this is faster, uh, this is more safer. I mean, you're not releasing chemicals to the environment. You see, you're not harming other cells around. You're not changing the environment around. Uh, so energy modeling can be done, some transmitter receiver. You see, I'm not, I haven't talked about this encoding, decoding part uh, in depth because we haven't thought about it so far. I mean, this is new. I mean, the, uh, the thing you are now listening to is, is from a, uh, our paper released like three months or two months ago. It's a very new thing. In addition to the unicast um, communication, you can use the, the, the system as a bro for a broadcast or a multicast system. So it has many applications. Again, you have to do some layer two, layer three issues if you want this uh, system to be a complete communication uh, system. And yeah, I think that's what we can, can say about the Cosm signaling. If you have any questions, any ideas, so I don't know. Two questions, maybe we can talk about the project also. Okay. If you have questions. More questions? We assign it today? Yeah. Yes. You want to, so I think you this, uh, decided on your project, right? <laughs> so we can give you that project, no? <laughs> uh, well, you not, what, what do you think? So to what I mentioned, yeah. I will need to do a very uh, high amount of research, I think. Not very high amount, no, 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 it's like, I don't know, 20 papers, maybe. <laughs> and the problem is they're all biology papers. A biological statistic, I think. No, not, not books. They're new things. I mean, they're not in the books, as far as I know. I mean, very basic parts are in the books, but beyond that, not. Okay, I mean, I'm joking. Hmm? So, uh, okay, let me explain the project a little, little bit. Uh, the deadline, what's the deadline? 14th of December, is it good? Nine days. Nine. Nine days. It's not, not, not that bad. Nine days from now. From now, obviously, yeah. Start. Start, yeah. So eight and a half days, let's say. Uh, so we just want you to simulate uh, a brownie motion the diffusion that uh, Birkan explained in the previous hour. So there's a, uh, consider that a molecule is released here. It moves around in, uh, like a diff in a diffusion manner. And it may uh, read the receiver or may not read the receiver. Okay, we just want you to uh, find the probability of hitting for this receiver by replicating this experiment some amount of times and taking the average, like say, uh, uh, I have run this simulation 1,000 times, and in 900 of them, 
uh, the molecule hit the receiver, then you say my, my probability of hitting is 0.9. Okay? With this D value, this R cell value, uh, and this diffusion coefficient, and uh, the time limits. We don't want you to run the simulation for infinity, obviously. There's a time limit. Uh, can you go? Okay, yeah. So uh, we want you to run simulation for two different uh, distances, two and eight micrometers. The diffusion coefficient is constant. The uh, step time that you, you need to use in the uh, Brownian motion is constant. Uh, this is the simulation replication count, 20,000. And we want you to simulate this uh, with these numbers for one second and get a p hit. 10 seconds get another hit, uh, another p hit value. And uh, like that, uh, with three more time limits, because um, after a while, after some time, these graphs uh, should converge, okay? to a certain value. At very low t values, they can be you know, less than one in one or two dimensions. But as the time increases, it should be very close to the one, okay? I mean, it may not go to exactly one because you, know, you have to wait in for infinity, theoretically. Uh, but it will be very uh, close to one. Uh, one last thing is the dimension. Remember the Birkan talk about the, there's the one and uh, for one dimension, two dimension, which the p hit should be one in the long run. We also want you to run this experiment for one dimension, two dimension, three dimension, and a theoretical fourth dimension. Okay. Four. I know. Something. The output we want you uh, to show us to, uh, two graphs. One for D is equal to two Ks, one is D is equal to eight Ks, okay? At each graph, uh, the X will be the T, which is this, on a logarithmic scale. Uh, the Y will be the P heat value, and there will be four lines in each graph representing the different dimensions. Uh, log 10, not log 2, okay? So it should be like, I don't know, d is equal to 2 micrometers, uh, this is t, this is p hit, so it should be like, I don't know, 1, uh, 10, 100. There are some numbers here, like it should be like this for dimension is equal to 1, dimension is equal to 2, dimension is equal to 3, something like that, or reverse actually. This is 1, 2, 3, it should be. Okay? Is it clear what, what you should uh, be doing in here? Uh, in the scale, these are all x's, okay? The same amount in the graph. This is called the logarithmic scale, you know, you see, because it should be 1, 10, I mean, it shouldn't be like this if you put it on a normal scale, right? Can you go to the last page, a little bit down. Um, let me just say about this thing, because this is crucial. Uh, if you want to use it on a uh, code it on Microsoft Studio, the rand function in C is a very bad randomizer, okay? Don't use it. I mean, I have used it and the results are not very good. Uh, but the GCC's randomizer, MATLAB's, Java's, they're all very good randomizers for our project. If you want to use a C or C++ compiler, you can just search the web for the Mersan Twister code, which is a very good randomizer. It is a very short code, and it's available for free. I mean, if you have any, anybody have any trouble finding a Mersan Twister and insist on using Visual Studio, you can email me, I can send you the code. I mean, it's a free code, okay? 
submit. Mm -hmm. I'll submit. You will prepare a document explaining the system model and the graphs you will produce. And uh, one paragraph discussion about the graphs. Uh, you will put the document and the codes in a folder and zip and uh, you will deliver in a software.